They do? Okay. Well, I thought that was a special thing that I had that I could oh. invite you to. What about In-N-Out? Really do you have In-N-Out there? We do not. Okay, okay, okay. In-N-Out's <laughs> way better. Hunter, oh way gosh. better. Well, I thought we could be friends. No, but, no, no, uh, no, you wouldn't. Uh, you, ha- you haven't even tried it and out, have you? Um, I have. Well, no, no, no. you didn't get the animal style. That's the problem. I don't think I've ever it's heard of It's not on that. the menu. I've, I've been one time. Okay, okay. Yeah, you got to know the secrets. Uh, There's a whole secret menu at in and out so. Okay. Um, welcome. Just kidding. <clears throat> Welcome to the Hometown Hollywood Podcast, where you can find advice, inspiration, and strategies for success from talented people that are making a name for themselves inside the film industry, but outside of the major film cities. Here's your host, Travis Myers. Hello, my name is Travis Myers, and today's guest on Hometown Hollywood is Thomas Manning, a director of photography and editor based out of Mesa, Arizona. I'm super excited to have Thomas on the show because I'm a huge fan of his show slash channel on YouTube, Epic Light Media. Currently at the time of this recording, their channel is just shy of 100,000 subscribers and it's growing super fast. They pack every single video with so much valuable content about lighting story and how to actually make money doing video work that if you're not subscribed, you should because because you're missing out. Besides the YouTube channel, Thomas is a really talented DP who, in my opinion, has absolutely perfected the high-key commercial look that a lot of clients are looking for, and I think his work looks beautiful. In this interview, you'll learn how a documentary about Benjamin Franklin inspires YouTube success, knowing when you are prepared to make a gear purchase for your camera ecosystem. A little disclaimer, this answer might hurt, but it has a lot of truth to it. Seeking inspiration in places like a Gordon Ramsay masterclass, and how to network, find clients, and recognize ideal opportunities for new work. On previous podcasts, most of our guests have been freelance DPs or directors, and this one's a little bit different because Thomas is coming from the point of view as someone who is part of a production company. So I think this is going to be very valuable for a lot of people. If you are ever needing some inspiration on ways to be more creative or how to actually make a living doing this film thing, then I would recommend saving this podcast to reference back to. I already know you are going to enjoy hearing Thomas's story, so feel free to pause for a second, subscribe to Epic Life media and this podcast and we'll jump right into the interview you probably don't want me to say this because of what you've said on your youtube channel so many times but your show is hands down my favorite channel on youtube right now thanks Uh, i've actually i used one of your tips today because i watched your b-roll video and like i thought it through and it helped me become a better person so that's good to hear. That's really great. Uh, you have me converted. Um, and I've also never seen so many practical tips on how to become a better filmmaker and how to make money doing it. A lot of people are kind of hush hush about that. Right. And uh, you seem like an open book with your channel. Yes. Um, guide us through the journey of Epic Light Media and the YouTube channel. So Epic Light Media is a company. We uh, make commercials. And uh, we started like six years ago, um, maybe a little longer than that. And uh, we've been very busy since since we started. Uh, and uh, but but we've we've been so busy that we uh, we didn't really have time to to have an online presence. Uh, never really did anything on Instagram or YouTube or anything. Um. And our website was just one little demo reel with one paragraph on it, you know, just nothing really going on online. And I uh, that website it was inspiring. Oh. <laughs> and it still is. <laughs> <laughs> the website is still one page. Um, but what happened was um, about a year ago, exactly from now, I uh, watched a documentary on YouTube that was ripped by someone, I forget. Uh, it's just a random old documentary about Benjamin Franklin, um, who I didn't really know much about. Turns out he was kind of a scumbag in some ways, but in many ways he was really cool uh-huh. as well. Um, so uh, I learned about Benjamin Franklin's life, and at, at, at the time he was an international celebrity. And one time when he went to France, he actually wore like a coonskin cap. Uh, because he thought that the French people would like assume that's what he would wear because he was from America. So he was like playing into their stereotype. He was like trolling them almost. (laughs) 
And anyway, the, the documentary did not address this at all. But I just got the sense that if Benjamin Franklin was alive right now, he would be a uh, an influencer. He would be all over social media and um, he would really know how to use it. Um, some things he did is he had like a bunch of church pews and a bunch of different churches just so he could like attend their meetings and have conversations with people to network. Um, but the thing that really got me the most interested is the documentary said that when he was young, he had like a printing press business and when he wasn't busy, he would run around the streets of the town with a, wheel, a wheelbarrow full of papers, and he would uh, talk to people about how busy he was. So That's awesome. When he, it's like the idea that, okay, so I'm like, okay, we have the opposite problem. We're so busy, and no one knows we're busy. So, so I... That's kind of where it started. And so we started thinking, what can we do uh, to get, you know, uh, our clients uh, to to see more from us? That's where it started. But then the first video we made was like a little video about how to film your little Star Wars toy to make it look like the movie Star Wars. That one. And so we, we kind of put that out and we realized like, OK, the content that we're making is for like. 18 to 35 year olds um, that are kind of interested in filmmaking. This isn't stuff that's going to appeal to our clients because most of them are 60 year old people that aren't on YouTube at all. We said, we don't know where this is going, but um, so that video didn't go anywhere. It didn't get any views um, for like three or four months. And then all of a sudden that video and a few of the other videos that we had made at that point um, just started to grow. And uh, so since then, uh, we've made like 30 more videos. It's been a year. And we're almost to 100,000 subscribers. Yeah, I saw that. I think probably by the time we've published the podcast, it will be uh, <laughs> at 100,000. We didn't, we didn't expect for YouTube to grow. Um, we didn't anticipate it at all. We just wanted to do something online. And, uh, but now it's like, okay, this is growing. We better do something about this. This could get even bigger. It just keeps growing and growing. So, um, just, um, for the future of YouTube and, and going forward, um, I do enjoy it. I really do enjoy it, but there's also this like feeling of, okay, like for the foreseeable future, we need to be putting out a whole video every week and, uh, you know, it is very exciting and I'm very grateful that we can do it, but it's also kind of, you know, daunting, um, especially yeah, since sure. I didn't really ask for this. But anyway, <laughs> so that's where we're at right now. That's amazing. I know that's got to be, I mean, you talked about how much uh, work you have and how many clients you're like doing videos for. And like you're like some people, they treat YouTube as their full time thing. Like that's their job. And so you have a full time uh, company and then also doing the YouTube as like with as much information and with as much quality as people who are doing this full time. How do you make time for <laughs> all of that um, all of that content you're producing? Well, I'm married with three kids and I should see my family more often. That's my problem. I, <laughs> I we pull a lot of late nights. Um, so. Also, yeah, so <laughs> um, <laughs> just, yeah, working hard. I, I don't have any other, um, and most of the guys here that work with us too, we, we don't really have lives outside of what we're doing here. I'm not a sports fan. I don't really listen to music. I, I don't watch a lot of movies. I just like working. And so that's kind of all I do. <laughs> I've seen uh, several, like either on your Instagram or uh, your website, like this is all we think about. So you're not kidding when you say this is all we think about. Yeah, it's pretty much it. That and Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> that was, yeah, I don't know why that really, that really <laughs> was the catalyst that like got us started. It was kind of weird, but um, just this, the idea of using the play. Here's my other thing about YouTube. Um, it, it really got me thinking about like the, the town square, uh, uh, hmm. you know, the, and that was, that was around a lot longer than YouTube. Uh, people would hang their wooden signs or, 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 uh, 
a person selling goods on the side of the road in the town would would yell, you know, come over here, look at this incredible thing that I'm going to sell you, try to get people's attention. Um, and in this modern age, YouTube or, you know, any kind of online source that you can use, that is the the new town square. That's where everything's happening. It's all invisible. You look around you, there's just people walking around the street, you know. So the real town square is online. And so we just thought we needed to, we realized we needed to enter that space, you know. That's a good way to think about it. I've never thought about the evolution of the town square before. Um, hear ye, hear ye. Yeah. Epic Light Media. <laughs> exactly. So you, I've heard you talk about your journey before as a pool cleaner. Uh <laughs> Let's take a deeper dive into the pool clean. No. Um, yeah, sure. That's funny. <laughs> uh, so when did you know that this was what you wanted to do full time? And how did you make the jump? I heard a little about the commercial you made where you kind of just went all in. Could you uh, go into that uh, a little bit more? And like yeah. the construction of the company of Ep- Epic Light Media? Yeah. So... When I was a little boy, we would always film. Uh, I was I was the one that would really, you know, beg my friends uh, during every summer to try to film. And um, my some of my friends they they had a really nice camera, and they actually wouldn't even let me touch it. I would always be thinking of the shots, but they didn't want me to ruin it, so they wouldn't let me hold it most of the time. Um, finally, got my own little camera when I was a teenager, and just that was always, you know on my mind, but it wasn't, I wasn't looking forward to what I would do at that point. And then when I was 20, uh, 21, I had a conversation with my brother and it was very impractical. He said, what would you do with your time if you had a billion dollars and never had to work again in your life? And without thinking, he said, without, you know, without thinking, tell me what it is. And without thinking, I said, I would make videos. And so this was right after I got married and we got 700 bucks for our um, wedding in cash. And I went to, my wife let me do this. I can't believe she did. It was all the money we had. We (laughs) went to, I went to Best Buy and I got a Canon T4i um, with a a lens. And uh, I started making, um, believe it or not, way back then in 2011 or 12, um, silly YouTube videos and I put them online and it was just like comedy sketches and stuff and I didn't really mm-hmm. for all for as much as I love filmmaking I didn't even know about like white balance or iris I had no idea what I was doing with my little camera and um, and uh, the videos were no good no one ever watched them they got like 20 views each you know it was nothing going on really it's big time right yeah there. <laughs> Um, and they were really strange. Um, and, uh, at the time I didn't really see, I, did, I, I feel like I was blind visually. I, I couldn't see how bad they looked. I just thought they looked great because I didn't really know what I was doing. But then I started watching channels on YouTube, like film riot. That was my first big channel. And I started becoming obsessed with the film look, um, understanding i wanted to make my images look like movies and i didn't understand why i couldn't do that and so over the next year or so i um really started to understand the basics of a camera i took a it took a lot to become very fluid with you know like how the camera works um i something i never had to learn was camera placement that was just instinctual like where the camera's going cutting and stuff i i always that was just always in me but understanding how to create an image quickly with a camera that's what i learned during that time and then i took down all those silly youtube videos and i started charging people friends and family um a few hundred bucks here or there to make um commercials for their small businesses and um at the time i was to make money i was a pool guy because my brother-in-law had a at a pool cleaning company. So I worked for him and uh, I would get off of work around one or two um, 
in the afternoon and then from there until the evenings film and edit and uh huh. so i was working on a short film and because i had just bought the canon 5d mark ii okay. and i wanted to test it out so randomly i was working on this short film it was kind of like a jason Bourne action thing and we were breaking a bunch of laws uh filming on some train <laughs> tracks yeah we did a lot of illegal stuff making this action <laughs> short film i had no idea how bad this was how dangerous we were being but um oh, really? <laughs> there was a guy on facebook who had an advertisement for his um drone business and i asked him if he could do drone piloting for our short film for free and he came out and i met him and i asked him what he did for work and he said oh i i make videos full time and that is my business partner now but at the time he had he was working for another company and then doing drone uh, videos on the side and this was back when uh -huh. um, they drones were you know you basically had to make your own drone so he had spent like twelve thousand bucks making his own giant drone oh my gosh <laughs> and he would attach a camera to it it could only fly for like four minutes but anyway he helped me with my short film and he got to know me and i got to know him and that was my first connection in the industry the first person i ever talked to that said they did video full-time and i remember I'll, I'll never forget where we were when he told me oh i do video full-time it's like something changed in my brain I was like, whoa, you could just like make actual money from this. Yeah. And I could see this future for myself, not having to just clean pools um, and do, do, do a job I hated. I could actually do this. So he was working for uh, a firm that did some political ads. And so the attorney general of Arizona, uh, he was working on his campaign. But James was also doing um, a lot of other ads. So because we had worked on that short film and he knew he could uh, work with me, he said, hey, I, I don't have time to do these TV ads for the attorney general. Could you do it? And so that's how I got my first TV ads. Um, and uh, I did a good job at that. I was prepared. You know, I, I had never done something at that yeah. level, but uh, luckily I was able to pull it off and, and make it look great. And um, so then when James left his um, company that he was working for that had done those ads, uh, we started Epic Light Media together. And that's mm -hmm. how it all started. Um, that's super cool. And I think the lessons I learned from that was show up and just doing stuff and talking to people and asking people about themselves and just reaching out to people. That's how you make connections, and you never know which connection is going to change your life. And meeting James totally changed my life because um, we work so great together, and we've been able to start this company together and um, have so many clients that we can work with from connections that James had from his last company. And so definitely a fateful couple years for me in my early 20s, deciding what I wanted to do. Um, going in, and here's another thing too about it. Um, I didn't know exactly like where I would be now, but it was almost like I just got pointed in the right direction. Um, it was in the right general direction, but it wasn't exactly where I ended up. But just saying to my brother, I want to do videos. It could have been any kind of videos. Could have been any department. I could, you know. But then it, over time, I narrowed in into to what I really like to do. So. Here That's I am awesome. now. Yeah, I've uh, I've heard to find something that you're really passionate about. Um, I read this book by Cal Newport. We said like a lot of the times, uh, finding your or just following your passion blindly is a bad idea for a lot of people. Like if you, I'm really passionate about llama yoga or something like that. Then if I just go over that, that might be a bad idea. But like as you follow things that you're good at and you have a general idea of like, okay, uh, I can do this. Um, usually, I don't know, careers that are filled with a lot of fulfillment are ones that are found along the way. And it seems like you have done that. <laughs> I mean, you found something you're good at and then you're also passionate about. So you got the best of both worlds there. Well, I, I do think that when you, yeah, when you're setting your sights on your future goals, it, the more specific you are, the harder things get. You know, you say, I want to play professional basketball for the Phoenix Suns. and I'm not going to settle for yeah. anything else. That's happened before. 
But, you know, the more specific you get, the harder it is. You know, I want to work for um, Steven Spielberg on set. That's my dream. It's like, well, that's kind of too specific. Um, so, yeah, you kind of find the specifics as you go. I, I think of it like a shotgun approach. You're not you're not hitting the bullseye. You're just pointing towards the dartboard um, and you're just aiming towards it in that general direction. And then um, over time, you can nudge the in the right direction. And I'm still, you know, it's still happening. It's not like I'm done. I'm still yeah, you know, sure. nudging my career in, in the way I want it to be and shaping my life. But um, if I would have gone to school for accounting and then found myself in the completely wrong position, it's easier to just change your life by a few degrees. For sure. I don't, I don't know if you've listened, but about one of our other guests, Nick Pilecki, he was a... Uh, an eye doctor. Uh, he went to school for nine years, became an eye doctor for two, and then picked up a camera and realized, I'm going to quit. Oh, man. <laughs> Did he? What happened? Did he? Oh, yeah. He's doing great. Wow. He's doing uh, amazing DP uh, work in, in Canada. And uh, I, I would say that's definitely not typical. <laughs> no, no, it's not. He's definitely an intelligent person and can adapt quickly. But uh, wow. pretty, pretty interesting. To say. <laughs> and I didn't. Oh, yeah, I didn't say this. I did not go to school. I was going to college when I stopped, and then we started Epic Light Media. But oh, really? I did not get a degree in this, um, and that wasn't just by my decision. Uh, there were a couple factors. I didn't. I didn't really have any money to go to school. Um, nor did I have someone to pay for my school. Um, and then number two, I, and this is something a lot of people don't know about me, I uh, have a very difficult time reading papers and concentrating on um, things like that. I do very well visually and um, with audio, but when it comes to you know reading, um, I can read a book, I can read a narrative book, whatever, but... Um, following instructions in school was always hard for me. So I don't think I, I don't know if I could have graduated college. I <laughs> it would have been very difficult for me to do that. Wow. That's uh that's really interesting. I have always thought like I read this, another book about, well, I don't know what it was, but it was all these successful people. And it seemed like every single one of them dropped out of college. It's like, you know what? The, the problem with me is that I haven't dropped out of college. And so I almost want to go back at, back to school just so I can drop out <laughs> to say that I have. That's funny. <laughs> but uh, that's really cool. I'm, well, I'm so glad that you have made the connection and were able to start your business because your stuff looks, um, it looks perfect. <laughs> like if I'm thinking commercials that go on TV, I mean, I know that as far as lighting goes, a very popular trend right now is the uh, low-key lighting that's very dark and moody. And in some cases, it looks great. And a lot of my own stuff, uh, at least the stuff I post, uh, kind of has that vibe. I think maybe because it can sometimes be cheaper to pull that off because you only really need like one light and a bounce and maybe some negative fill. Like on some of your commercials, uh, like Offer Pad. Right. Uh, I saw a couple of those. Um, those look great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it looks like they had a million dollar budget. Maybe they did. Um, no, they didn't. And then I saw the behind the scenes. Like our, you said something like our HMI went out, and we just set up an aperture 300D and a silk, and like dang. <laughs> Um, you, yeah, you worked magic. <laughs> I, uh, I have noticed this darker trend. Um, and I, I do shoot darker sometimes for, for some projects. Um, in fact, uh, I would say my natural style is tripod with no movement and basically natural light. Um, we have a short film on our YouTube channel, um, that, is pretty much my style. We didn't use any lights for it. No lighting. Oh, wow. And the camera is usually just on a tripod without movement. Uh, it's it's not, it, that's just what I like. But when I'm shooting for a client, I can't just do what I like. So 
when I'm shooting a pure speed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. People say, don't know. There were no lights on that. We didn't use anything. Well, uh, I was thinking like, man, this looks really natural. I wonder how they pulled this off. Right. Now I know it was natural. <laughs> and now when I say no lights, I mean, you know, we, we very carefully found spots and locations that looked good in, in, yeah. in the natural light. But um, so for, for our client work, I do um, shoot full power. Uh, I typically have all the lights at 100 percent and um, I just like bright looking stuff um, for those things. Um because usually the the projects we're working on are you know bright and happy you know they're supposed to be happy and uh, clean looking yeah so I I do enjoy that look too probably not as much for narrative stuff but for commercials I like bright looks uh, one of the biggest reasons why is because it's very palatable and um, uh, people are watching these commercials on their TVs or phones and I want them to understand what we're trying to tell them like in a nanosecond. I don't want them to have to squint or not see what's going on. Um, and so I like things to look very simple so that the brain can just understand what's happening without any other thoughts, you know? And so we're definitely on set. It's all about simplifying the frame, making it just cartoon lighting, just simple <laughs> um, so people can understand. There's a shot that I've seen in a couple of your videos of a brisket right <laughs> and i would just say that is just uh that's unfair to do that to people <laughs> because that looks so good <laughs> i've never seen meat look so wonderful and so i just want to congratulate you on having uh the best meat shot <laughs> in the business funny as weird as that sounds yeah we were having a lot of fun shooting that commercial for that company they're kind of a, they let you eat it uh, I don't think we did. Oh no! Yeah, I'm pretty sure we didn't. Oh uh, yeah, most of the shots, like definitely, like the when it was in the sandwich, it was covered with like WD-40 to make it glisten. Oh, and uh, I think we had some like bitters paint uh, uh, that we painted on it. And um, anyway, <laughs> well, you had me fooled. Yeah, so one of the things that uh, that you do so well, and you said that you pretty much learned on YouTube and um, things on the internet, is the high key lighting that we talked about. Uh, I haven't found a lot of resources uh, to do that well, um, and also, like I'll find an occasional trick on food photography and or food lighting. What resources do you have? Or do you use to continue learning um, or what resources would you recommend to somebody who is uh, starting out or just wants to continue their education in filmmaking besides your channel? Because your channel is a great resource. It's tough. I think with, with a resource like YouTube, I uh, there was a time when I was just eating it up and I was watching a lot of it. And then it kind of became where I wasn't learning as much because um, I got a little bit more advanced than what I was learning on a lot of the channels. And I've, I just watch a lot of boring, like, don't be afraid to watch, you know, the interview of Roger Deakins that lasts an hour. Um <laughs> Or these random, I just, I don't even know their names. I watch hour and a half long videos of these random cinematographers on YouTube just going through things. Um, so, I'm. Uh, the other thing is, I, I don't always learn uh, from filmmakers. Um, there's so many things I can learn from, from other creative people like we we have a master class um yeah. and there's some cooking um videos on there um forgot his name everyone knows him he uh gordon ramsey um there are some other some other guys too um and just watching that i learned like about creativity more you know <laughs> um oh. uh reading books is good just you know uh I'm I'm reading Harry Potter again right now cuz that's one of my favorite books. Um and I just see the shots, you know. So I'm like my own filmmaker when I'm doing that. Um 
I do think, you know, when it comes to lighting and stuff, it, it mostly is experience. Working around real crews can teach you a lot, like seeing how real gaffers and directors of photography work on real sets really helps. Um, but in terms of like placing the camera and framing shots, which I'm actually the most passionate about, but it's a hard thing to teach. It's um, it's a matter of filming every scenario you walk into. So out of habit, I can't even help it. When Whenever I'm seeing people talk or I'm talking with someone or I'm walking down the street, I'm always filming in my mind what I'm seeing. And I think hmm. a lot of filmmakers could probably relate to this. You're just thinking you know, about where, you know, what would it look like if the camera was there or there? Like you can get really inspired by other people's work, but it's not all the way, all always gratifying to just copy what other people are doing. Um, so you really want your work to kind of come from you. Um, and that's when it's the most satisfying but really for this commercial stuff that I shoot, it's always the same, you know, it, it's like, you know, there, we adapt it for each environment, but it's always a backlight. It's always a fill. It's always a bounce. It's always an accent light in the background. And that'll change. Sometimes you need a bunch of HMIs through a window for that accent light. Sometimes you need a giant soft source in the front. Sometimes, sometimes it's a smaller light to get the same effect. There's so many different ways of getting the same effect, but really it all comes down to the same principles that I've taught in YouTube. Um, it's not much more complicated than that. Um, it's just a matter of understanding the basics and then, uh, and then getting used to changing them up um, for every scenario you walk into to make it the best it can. And then the other thing is just um, uh, looking at the image and just asking yourself, what can I do next to improve it? You know, and, and identifying trouble spots, you know, what's not looking right here. Okay. Then I'll fix that. Um, so I don't know. It, it's kind of hard to teach it. Um, I try to on YouTube, but I never feel like I'm fully explaining, but anyway, well, I, <laughs> I would, uh, say the opposite. I think you're an exceptional teacher and, I've even showed my wife your videos who has almost no interest in filmmaking. I'm like, man, if you just sat down and watched uh, as many videos as you could of Epic Light Media, then you would know probably more than 90% of the people who are actually getting paid to do this. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but I really appreciate the way, how you make it so simple. Like, I'm going to raise my kids on your videos because I hope they get into filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> uh because I feel like you make it simple enough where a 10-year-old could do it, or 10-year-old could pull off a really high level of work. And that's scary <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, I don't know, that can be scary, but at the same time, I really appreciate it. Um, speaking of which, I, uh, I've been getting a lot of comments lately on YouTube about how I people say, like, you're talking to me like I'm a little kid. And... Um, uh, on one of our uh, commercials, like three or four years ago, we had a, a set decorator who kind of, she wasn't upset with me, but she was, I don't know. She's like, hey, you're, you're talking to me like I'm a little kid. Like, what the heck? <laughs> and uh, I'm like, I. Is that just something? That I told happens? her, like, I'm so sorry. I'm talking like that to everybody. Like, that's how I talk to people. Um, the other thing that I get a lot is. Um, People ask me if I'm like really depressed or down because if I'm not like trying to look happy, I actually look really um, upset most of the time. So I, if people think <laughs> I'm talking to them like kids or I'm, I'm really depressed if I'm just sitting there. So so you've got uh, there's no middle ground. No, just, apparently not. I love with you. Yeah. It's like I talk to everyone <laughs> like they're kids. And then when I'm not talking, I look depressed. So anyway. <laughs> That's how, I've been accused of that as well. I think people think I'm just depressed all the time. Uh, but I've got these angry eyebrows, oh. and people think I'm just ticked at them all the time. Oh, no. Really, uh, I'm just not. Um, I really don't take myself that seriously enough to be mad at someone for that long. So That's exactly how I uh, feel. Yep, yep. It's okay. We can relate. That's, that's funny. That was a question I always had, and now I've 
That's the reason I have this podcast to find out the secrets that mm-hmm. no one else will know. Um, so, so you do mostly commercial work, and um, I did see your your short film, Pure Speed, and we talked about that a little bit. Do you see yourself strictly doing commercials, or do you have a vision of making more films and pursuing that route? Um, or is it one of those things that you feel like you're just going to find the path like we've been talking about earlier? Yeah, we'll see. Um, I, I am interested in narrative work. I, uh, I don't, I, I do understand, however, that uh, to really pull off a great movie, you need a, a whole team of people. You need the actors. Um, you need great design. Um, so many talented people come together. And I'm not interested in making something that's that's not going to be um, enjoyable to watch. And I don't want to go into a project unless I feel like we have at least the bare minimum to make that happen. Um, I don't have a strong connection with um, actors in Arizona here where I'm at. Um, I do have ideas for stories. Uh, we, we, you know, at Epic Light Media, we're we're always talking about ideas for movies down the road, um, but it has not come together yet. So, sometime in the future, though, we we do want to make a low budget movie. Um, and in terms of my, uh, what really gets me excited is. Um, movies like Napoleon Dynamite. Napoleon Dynamite is one of my favorite movies of all time. And I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. The, the style, the, um, the tone, the pacing, but obviously that's, that's Jared Hess's style. That's not mine, but, um, uh, something that, uh, is simple and, uh, real life and, uh, doesn't really require us, you know, going outside of, uh, something that's filmable in just a normal urban environment um, is what I'm interested in. Uh, we've got a lot of ideas, but uh, anyway, something in the future would be good. I I think it is possible, especially for us. We've got all the gear um, to be able to pull something off, um, but we would need to take off a month to film it. Um, yeah. And during that time, if you're not doing your work for your clients, they're going to hire someone else and they might never go back to you again. Yeah. So we can't just say no. It's like, you can't just turn off the switch. It's a machine. It's got to keep running at this point. Yeah, exactly. So it's hard to step away from everything and all the clients that are coming to you and turn them away because then you might come back after you're done with the movie and have nothing left. Mm. The, the, the engine stopped running at that point with your clients. So, that's kind of what's stopping us, mostly. I had read somewhere that the inspiration, a part of the inspiration for Napoleon Dynamite, or maybe Jared Hess's style, was a documentary he saw, I think, about a funeral home. Yeah, I talked about that in one of our videos, Gates of Heaven. If okay. anyone's listening to this, go watch Gates of Heaven on YouTube. Maybe I learned it from you. See? <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing. I haven't seen the movie yet, or at least the documentary. Uh, it's on my to-do list. But I think that's interesting. Like that wouldn't be the first place I would think to get inspiration for a movie like that. Like, uh, but maybe it would be right. I, I I do think it's important to not get inspiration from other movies as much as it is yeah from other things. When you're going to make a movie or a project, try to get inspiration from other mediums because they share so much and. It'll just be more original that way. Like I say, I love Napoleon Dynamite. That's my favorite movie, but I would hate to go into a project trying to recreate that, you know, because I'm never going to be able to, and so I'll never be satisfied. So you kind of have to try to do your own thing or your own amalgamation of ideas um, to make something unique. That it's interesting when you're thinking about making a new movie. Uh, I see so many short films and so many low budget movies that are unoriginal in every way. And of the guy it's getting like, ready. Why, the why is, yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy getting ready more. <laughs> it's like, why are we remaking this? This has already been made. 
There's no point in remaking this either that than to prove to yourself that you can copy somebody. Um, and so, mm. yeah, it's like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just extra fodder that's just like, okay, a waste of people's time. Like an artist saying, look what I can trace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at this lighthouse. Okay, okay. People have painted that so many times. <laughs> Stop it. That's why they sell it a Dollar Tree. Right, exactly. I know that gear isn't the most important thing, but it also is somewhat important. Now, this is probably a selfish question because I'm sick and tired of <laughs> messing up with this. But how do you know it's the right time to purchase a gear or a gear gear or a camera? First thing I would say is you shouldn't think of any of your gear as just you know uh, existing separate by itself. It's a whole ecosystem. So if you buy a new camera that's a little bit bigger than your last one, you're probably going to have to buy a bigger tripod. Um, you know, uh, you're going to need to buy some great sound equipment that's going to work well with that camera. Um, new cases, that's always a big thing. Sorry, you're going to have to spend 500 bucks on a case if you're going to get that piece of equipment. So, it's always so painful. Yeah, deal, yeah, cases. It's like if you don't have a case, you have a broken product that you bought. So cases, where are you going to store it? Um, those are all things you got to think about. But in terms of like buying a new camera... Um, I remember a moment when I was filming on the 5D Mark II, I was filming a commercial, and I looked at the image later in the computer, and I remember thinking, I, I'm pretty sure I just made this camera look as good as I possibly could. Hmm. And I understand this camera, and I'm ready to move on. And that's when we bought, I think, like the Canon C100 and I felt I could do even better. So and, until you feel like your camera's holding you back and not your talent, then, and you have the extra money. And all, also the rule of thumb is, besides the time when I spent all of our money on our, my first camera, the rule of thumb is if you, if you can't buy 10 of it, then you can't afford it. So uh, I know mm -hmm. that's kind of hard to hear for some people, but yeah. But if you have enough money in your bank account to buy ten of those cameras, then you can afford it. So, be, don't I? You know, don't go into debt. I'll never for be gear. able to afford anything. Again. <laughs> <laughs> don't go. Don't go into debt for gear. Wait, 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 and uh, it's always better until you feel like you you're just noticing. Like for example, if you're just noticing all the moray from your from your camera on on and it's bothering you and it, you're just pulling your hair out over it then get a camera that you know or fix that so you don't have the array issue anymore or if the resolution's just not high enough and you keep wanting to do things with your shots and it's just too soft then it's time to get a new camera but um with the cameras we have for example we have the ursa you know i've got the ursa mini pro g2 uh, we got the 12k in the mail coming right now um what? Yeah, of course. But with the cameras we have, I don't feel like I'm not seeing issues with them that would make me want to get an Alexa Mini or something, you know. So I'm not, I don't have any issues with the image. Now, I'm sure someone or some DP or something would look at our images and say, okay, I'm not going to shoot on that camera for this or that reason. So I'm going to spend 80 grand on this other camera. But the cameras we have, they're they're pretty, you know, if, to some people, they're like top of the line. But to us, you know, we see them as like low range, you know, I mean, a $6,000 camera, that's nothing, uh, you know, uh. compared to what they're shooting movies on that are $80,000 cameras or more with a $100,000 lens on the front of it on a $20,000 tripod or whatever, or a giant, you know, crane or whatever. So we're, we look at our gear as very cheap for what we're doing. And... um uh, anyway, when I'm looking at the images, I'm very happy. There's seldom, th there are a few issues I do have with it, um, but they're not worth, you know, upgrading and spending that money on right now. Um, but yeah, so every situation's different. I can't tell people what to do, but it, also if you, if you just don't understand your camera, um, that is, that is the number one thing to making a camera looking good understanding exactly every feature of it just knowing it by heart um 
because really, if you really know a camera good enough, you can make pretty much any camera look good if you just know it well enough. That's the most important thing. So spend more time with your camera. Invest, you know, make sure that, you know, because if you get a brand new camera, even if it's a great camera and then you have a shoot two weeks later and you just bought this new camera, you might not know the settings well enough and you're not going to do as well on your shoot than if yeah. you had a cheaper one that you actually knew. So those are some of my thoughts with gear. And and in terms of priorities, I would say a camera is one of your lowest priorities. S- good stands, um, heavy duty stands, a great tripod, a fantastic expensive audio equipment. You know, b- buy a thousand dollar microphone before you buy a three thousand dollar camera. Like for sure. Okay. Like you know, um, invest in good audio gear before you invest in the top of the line camera um invest in a great tripod before you buy a, a good camera so yeah if you if you're spending five thousand bucks on a camera and then you have like a three hundred dollar tripod there's a problem um anyway yeah, i've that's one thing i've uh been trying to do myself is i'm realizing that at the beginning i did I bought a camera that I should not have bought, and I'm stuck with it. It was the uh, Ursa Mini 4.6K. And as soon as I bought it, they released the Pro version, and nobody wanted the 4.6K. Like, it was just to the point where I couldn't send it back. Yeah, I got stuck. And then I I bought it um, thinking I was going to make it big with this little local 48-hour film race. (laughs) One of my goals was like, some people locally had put me down or something, or they made me feel like I didn't know what I was doing. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to blow them out of the water. <laughs> we uh, bought it, and I did not spend the time I needed uh, getting to know it. And so we get our first shot locked down, and I'm ready to shoot, and I press the screen, and all of the menu options went away. I'm like, what the heck? And uh, we were out in the middle of nowhere, so we didn't get really great service. And so I was trying to look up, like, how do you make the, <laughs> how do you make the options show up on the camera so I can change the settings? And so we spent a good forty-five minutes, maybe an hour, oh, to realize no. you just had to flick up. Oh, <laughs> I know that is so sad. Yeah, um, yeah. We, that, those we are some up weird. Winning no. the film race, Man. you did win. Yes. We did win That's great. the Beaumont Boomtown film race. That's great. So we beat all five contestants. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Hey, that's yeah. a that's a yeah, that is a very interesting though. You gotta know your camera before you you show up because yeah, that's a that's a very basic thing on that camera. Um, you may not know to flick up on the day. It's a de- that it's kind of a design flaw, how like simple that is and how yeah, but I, I blame black magic for that one. So I hear over and over that connections are the most important assets and finding work in the film industry, um, whether it be clients or um, other filmmakers uh, that you can collaborate with. Do you have an active approach for networking? Or at this point, do you think people just reach out to you because, like I did, because I found your YouTube channel? Um, How does that work for you? So... We're very strategic with our approach. Um, we we do identify people that we want to connect with and the reason why we want to. And uh, if they're local, we'll have lunch with them. Uh, we do a lot of lunches trying to just connect with people unless we're super busy. Um, the other thing is on set, always, always just being fun and making the set environment different than a serious film set. Um, just have it be fun. And uh, people on set, you never know who, who's going to be there and or the friend of somebody who's going to hire you for your next job. Um, knowing which people to talk to, uh, understanding what they do for work or, or who they are and what connections they have. And, and knowing, like, for example, like, um, a couple years ago, we did a free video for a lady's daughter who was running for treasurer in fourth grade at her elementary school. We made her a campaign video for free. 
That's awesome. um, we went all out and it was like, because her mom was an extremely influential person who we needed to get on her good side because that could be like a few hundred thousand dollars worth of work over the next couple of years. So we knew like, Hey, this mm. is worth it. So sometimes it's like, okay, this is worth it to make this free video for this person because this person is seriously connected and I want them to owe me a favor kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so identifying those kind of things, um, it's important. Just having good people skills, knowing who to talk to. Um, I don't know if it's something can, that can be totally taught. It's just more instinctual, I think. But no, we don't do any marketing. We don't We don't run ads or anything. Um, I... <sighs> I know this is probably strange to hear, but I, I feel like when you are marketing your work or putting something on Facebook, like, hey, we'll make a video for $250 or $1,000, and you're like putting it out there, um, you're going to get clients that are price conscious or hmm. you're coming to them. So they have the upper hand. Um, I really mm. love getting a phone call or an email from somebody out of the blue that chose to approach us because then they're the ones coming into our chamber, um, you know, saying, can I please talk to, talk to you about something? And it automatically puts us with the upper hand. So now we're the ones who are telling them, Hey, you know, you know, I know you only have this much money for the job, but we normally charge more than that. And so it, it gives us the, it gives us more power. And um, so it, it works differently for everybody. There's to totally different ways to make money. And, but I really like it when people come to us instead of us begging, in essence, with marketing for people to please contact us and make, you know, it's like we're desperate for work or something. Um, <laughs> but whatever. Some people would say like, okay, like stop overthinking it. Just ask people if, you know. Um, uh, run ads or whatever, but with the business that we do, particularly, it's B two B. It's not um, business to business. It's not just the general public. You know, the the average person, right. a couple hundred dollars is so much money, but to a corporation or a business, twenty thousand dollars sometimes is nothing. You know, so we want to do work for the big businesses because they see money differently than the average little person. So if your clients are you know, like wet, you know, weddings are a little bit different because they're blowing a bunch of money. But if you're doing, you know, if, <laughs> if a random person that's working hard every day to make money is paying you a thousand dollars, that is so much money to that person. And, yeah. but if you're, if you're networking with the right people and you're doing work for businesses or politicians or corporations or charities or something, then money's different. So networking with the right people is key for sure. I know, like I've talked to a lot of people in the filmmaking industry and a lot of them have said, like, I struggle with the business side of things. I don't know what to do. And so I think what you just said would help a lot of people. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Let's see. The last question I have is obviously you are a man of fashion. <laughs> Where do you get your button-down shirts? Um, Walmart, actually. Walmart, fifteen bucks. Some of them. Uh, just where you Fade know, I glory. I went to H M H and M the other day with a friend, and he was buying some clothes, and uh, I thought, hey, I need some new clothes, and I was just drawn to <laughs> these button-up shirts. So I just bought like three more of them. My closet's full of them. I feel most comfortable in just a button-up shirt and jeans. So. I think I found my uh, how I'm going to dress for the rest of my life. I think that's set. So that's that's wonderful. <laughs> you work it, and uh, you just keep doing that. I did hear. Um, I forgot where it was. I think it was a comedian. They said, "Like I don't want to think about what I have to wear every day. That wastes too much too much of my time. I have the same like I don't know. I think he has seven maybe four or five or whatever. I was like, I've got four pairs of jeans. I've got five t-shirts and I've got my shoes and that's it. And I wear <laughs> the same thing every day of my life. Cause I don't want that to ever consume me. And like, 
I was like, oh my gosh. And I tried to throw things away and I couldn't. But <laughs> I am looking for some button down shirts. <laughs> hey, they're comfy. Very comfy. So. All right. I really appreciate you being on the show today uh, for the listeners that we do have. Uh, where would you tell them that they could? I know they're going to, they're going to want to follow your work. Uh, where would you tell them that they could do that? Just checking out our YouTube channel, but don't subscribe because we already have enough subscribers. Um, but you can find someone else to subscribe to. That would be great. There's a lot of people out there. But yeah, watch our watch our videos. Leave a nasty negative comment if you want. Or a nice one. We don't care. Thomas, you have fulfilled my dream. When I first started watching your shows, I thought, this is the nicest person on the internet right now. And one day I'm going to have to tell them that, or tell him I am his biggest fan. <laughs> um, and I'm six foot six. And if I don't keep on my diet, I actually will be your biggest fan. <laughs> so uh, just get ready for that day. But thank you for being on the show. And I really enjoyed having you. This was fun. This was a pleasure. I've uh, never done a remote podcast like this. and uh, But it felt like we were having a good conversation. And it was great. So thank you. And that's it. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please pause for a second, write a review, and let me know how the interviews are helping you in your film journey. I hope this helps you do great work, be the artist you want to be, and helps you not to be afraid to jump in with both feet and make things happen in your film community. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, share, and spread the word with your film friends. Leave a comment in ways that I can improve as a host, what you liked about the show, or questions you would like answered from future guests. This really helps me grow the show, and I will give you a big, huge virtual hug. Stay tuned for our next awesome guest on the Hometown Hollywood Podcast. I w in our first couple of videos we posted, I actually said, please subscribe. But I felt my soul just like crumbling <laughs> when I said that. It just, I did not feel like a gen I could genuinely say that just for some reason. Um, I just felt like it was too much self-promotion or something. So I just randomly, when the camera was rolling, said unsubscribe. And we kept that in one of the videos. And that's kind of when... Oh, that was one of the first videos that took off actually that was yeah really so yeah um so we just have kept saying it i don't know what to do i, I feel like i'm almost stuck saying it now I <laughs> yeah you're stuck <laughs>